Uh, today, I am very excited to introduce Felix Verkenkamp. So Felix um, uh, did his PhD at ETH Zurich, and he's really, uh, I think, one of the like pioneers of this kind of whole safe learning uh, area. And so he, he wrote a lot of kind of like these initial papers that sparked a lot of interest. And uh, in fact, kind of, kind of in part from some of his effort, as well as some other people, it led to to that conference that I mentioned before, this, this learning for dynamics and controls conference and like a whole subfield of, of uh, interest. And so I know that many of you have uh, been reading Felix's papers as you're working on your class projects. And so I'm really excited that he uh, agreed to present, especially since sometimes it can be tricky to get industry people to be able to present. Um, but Felix works for Bosch in, in Germany and has a super sweet research scientist job there. And maybe he can also comment on uh, and today he's going to tell us a little bit about like balancing exploration while maintaining safety uh, for model-based reinforcement learning. So with that, take it away, Felix. All right, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. So I certainly don't want to credit, uh, claim credit for the entire field, um, but <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there's, there's been some really nice research in this direction. And so this lecture is really kind of trying to connect some of the things you've seen already in the course. So, um, you know, things about, how do I actually ensure safety in a system if I have some measure of uncertainty and connect that a bit more with the machine learning side, uh, specifically, how do I actually collect data and kind of how does it affect my learning progress now that I have safety constraints and what are all these kind of interesting connections. So I try to stay relatively high level. There's a bit of math at times. Uh, and so the problem with kind of a remote lecture and then a kind of a guest lecture together is that it's really difficult to judge kind of what you know, what's obvious to you, what's not. So if something's not clear, just ask uh, right in the chat. If I don't see it, somebody uh, just shout and ping me. Um, if nobody shouts and Silver, you have the idea that kind of, okay, I'm just uh, drifting off, just ask me a really obvious question like, hey, could you explain to me again what a Gaussian is or something like this? Um, and then I'll, So you're okay I'll... with us just interrupting if we have questions? Yes, definitely. Okay. So I'd rather not get to the end of the slides if kind of the part through the slides has been clear. So whenever you feel lost, just give me a shout and we'll clarify things. All right, so with that, um, as you mentioned, so I work um, for Bosch and Bosch is somehow this very traditional old company that has a lot of manufacturing processes and kind of plans and their core business is really to yeah, design physical systems and make physical systems work and make them work reliably so that they can sell them onto others. And they have a lot of kind of engineering exp expertise and kind of really know about their systems. Um, but recently they've kind of really shifted towards AI and are investing heavily in AI. And the reason for that is that, I mean, AI is to some extent a threat to their core business, right? Like AI has the promise of making a lot of these manual kind of design jobs faster. And if you don't kind of keep up with this, it becomes really challenging. And so as part of that, Clearly one method that's super interesting if you're designing control strategies is reinforcement learning. I'm sure you've seen kind of a slide like this uh, a bunch of times. Um, so reinforcement learning is this idea that you have some system often called the environment and you want to control that in some kind of optimal way. And optimal usually means that you want to maximize some reward signal that you specified. So the interaction goes like this. You have some learning agent that selects a certain action. So for example, from a control policy, applies that and then you get to see the next state and you get to see how good that action was. So just this one step transition, kind of how good would I judge, judge this to be based on a reward function. And like I said, the goal here is to maximize the sum of rewards over time. So it's not a myopic problem, but really we kind of repeatedly apply actions. And now this is super nice, right? Because in principle, I can now go to any system and I can plug in my learning agent and hopefully everything will work out. And the key here really is that we somehow need to trade off exploration and exploitation. So since we don't know the environment in advance or we don't know it perfectly, on the one hand, we need to somehow collect data to figure out kind of how is the environment reacting to my actions. And on the other hand, once we've gathered some knowledge and kind of learn about the environment, we need to pick actions that kind of do exploitation. So try to actually maximize the reward and really do well. So it's really this trade off that's at the core of this problem. And you've kind of probably seen kind of a lot of really exciting applications of this, let's say solving some video game or some kind of board game. And these are really impressive, right? These are things that we couldn't do like a decade ago. 
And it's, it's really cool that this is now possible, but there's one kind of key assumption in reinforcement learning, and that's that kind of the train environment, so environment that you're kind of optimizing your policy on is equal to the test environment. So there's no notion as you would have in supervised learning of here's my train data, and then I want to generalize to this test, test data, but really it's the same environment. So to some extent, reinforcement learning always means we're overfitting to the environment that we're training on. Now that's fine in general, right? If I have a board game that I know the rules of perfectly or some computer game that I can kind of keep playing out, everything's fine. But what happens if somehow our experiments are really expensive? So if you have some physical system or some physical robot that you want to interact with. And similarly, if you go to real systems, you can't typically just do this kind of random exploration that is typical in reinforcement learning, but you have some sort of safety constraints. And you really don't want to have like a physical robot that is kind of unaware of its safety constraints and it's just crashing into walls during the learning process because by the end of the learning process, you will no longer have a robot or a physical system to control um, and all of your kind of learning progress was kind of in vain. And these problems really matter. And they matter if you want to apply AI to kind of physical systems. And this is kind of why at Bosch, kind of we have a bit of a different focus than you would see them kind of normally from these typical kind of big tech companies, but we're really kind of focusing more on how to kind of interact with physical systems, how to do that data efficiently, how to guarantee safety, how to really incorporate uncertainty. And then we also clearly care about kind of privacy and robustness, but this lecture is really gonna be about this left half of the slides. So kind of how can we do data efficient learning? Um, how can we ensure safety during learning and robustness? And what does uncertainty have to do with all of that? And so kind of the last slide about Bosch is, uh, so we are actually more bigger than most people think. So we actually spread out all over the globe by now, and we have lots of kind of really re exciting research labs. So if you're looking for a job after your studies, uh, please consider us. <laughs> all right, so much for um, the Boschy part. Now let's actually talk about um, the kind of problem that we want to solve. So throughout this uh, kind of lecture, we'll consider a physical system. And so we'll have some kind of state, which are called S because I've spent too much time in uh, the machine learning community. Um, if you've seen control lectures, it would be X, um, but for us, it's gonna be the state S and that's gonna evolve according to some kind of dynamic system. And it's gonna have a special structure that we're gonna assume here, namely it's gonna be this deterministic function F that kind of tells us given the current state SN and the current action that we've selected, how can we uh, kind of, how will we go to the next state? But it's kind of a stochastic system. So we don't only have this physical quantity F, but there's also some noise. And so this noise omega N is gonna be drawn IID at every step. So it's really the randomness that enters our system. So one important caveat already, right? So this is a, it's an MDP. So it's a fully observed system. There's no kind of notion of I only observe part of my state, but it's really like a, kind of a, a basic system where you can see everything, you can see all the states. Um, and we're just trying to interact with that in an optimal way. So we're gonna make uh, some assumptions about the system. So it's gonna be pretty mild. So we're gonna assume that this uh, noise has, has expectation zero. So that kind of on average, if we kind of do lots and lots of um, transitions from the same state and the same action, on average, we'll end up with um, what F would be. And I mean, if there wasn't, if the noise wasn't zero mean, you could just include that in F and it wouldn't be that dramatic. Uh, so notably this omega n, and this is super critical, is called aleatoric uncertainty. So this is really stochasticity that is every time I do an experiment, it's gonna be different. And we're gonna talk about this a, a bit more later. So next uh, we should decide kind of what to do with the system, right? We have the stochastic system now, let's say this robot that evolves to some, um, through some dynamics through time, and we want to optimize that. And for that, we need some kind of objective. And this we're gonna call J. And our goal here is to find this policy pi star, so some control strategy that maximizes this performance objective. And I've written this here in a bit of a peculiar way um, where kind of J depends on the dynamics F and the policy pi. Um, this is gonna be clear later why we do this, um, but one of the most common notions of um, cost is to have this additive over time. This is kind of also what we saw on the first slide in this reinforcement learning setup. And that means our performance objective is gonna be just the sum of rewards. You could discount this as you want, but for us, it's just gonna be the sum of rewards for now for simplicity over a finite horizon. So from time step zero, n equals zero to a big N, given some initial state as zero. 
And since there's stochasticity in the system, we're going to average over this noise. So we just want to do really well on expectation, which is a really reasonable assumption given that our noise is additive. So, so far, hopefully, this has seen somewhat um, familiar. So this is just a stochastic optimization problem. So in principle, you could just take out your favorite dynamic programming and optimal control book and throw it at that problem and see what happens. Um, of course, you could also kind of go directly to reinforcement learning algorithms and apply those. It doesn't really matter. We know f in the setting, and we could optimize the system. So that's optimal control. The difference to reinforcement learning really is that we don't know the dynamics function f. So there's what we call epistemic uncertainty. So there's uncertainty that isn't actually present in the system. I mean, there's a deterministic function f, like the, my world somehow behaves according to some physical laws and dynamics but I just don't know them. And that's epistemic uncertainty. And this is what makes reinforcement learning really interesting because in practice, if I go to a new system, I could often spend the time to really hand engineer and figure out what's going on and invest a lot of money to kind of build a perfect model. But ideally, it'd be great if we didn't need this, right? Ideally, we would just go to a new system, kind of apply our reinforcement learning algorithm, and that would be the end of it. So let's see how, what we can do with this problem. So just to reiterate one last time, so there are two sources of uncertainty in the system here, right? There's aleatoric uncertainty. So this is stochastic randomness that I can't learn about. This is omega n. And that means kind of if I go to my robot, let's say this quadrotor, and I apply some control strategy, I'm going to see different trajectories every time I repeat this experiment. I can always start at the same state. I will always apply in a policy, but there will be some randomness in my system. And this is the part that we average over as part of our performance objective. Epistemic uncertainty is really uncertainty about this deterministic function f. So I don't know kind of how big my robot is, how heavy it is, the exact aerodynamics that govern my quadrotor, something like this. And crucially, this is not part of my performance objective. This kind of comes from me not knowing the system perfectly, but it's not really something I care about, right? Like ideally, I just want to optimize this original system. It's just that I happen to not know this, and that's why we call it epistemic uncertainty. So given enough data, ideally, I could learn about epistemic uncertainty. I can't learn about aleatoric uncertainty. All right, so back to our goal. So we want to find this policy that maximizes this performance objective. And now since we don't know f, we necessarily are going to be in some kind of interactive setting. So we can no longer directly just write down a solution using, using optimal control, but we really have to interact with the system. And that's now uh, going to mean that at each time, somehow we get to select some policy that we use to interact with the system. So I get to, for example, pick uh, the parameters of my PID controller or some neural network or whatever control strategy is kind of uh, favorable at the moment and I get to apply that to the system. And then what I see is kind of the interaction data with the system. So I get to observe the trajectory of um, different states and different actions that happen in the real world. So just to visualize this, so we have some robot and let's say we want to have this go to this target here on the right side, this blue dot. So kind of I get to pick my first policy, pi zero. Let's say I just, I mean, I, I don't have any information, I just, wrote down some PID controller or something like this or sampled a neural network, I'm just going to apply this and it's obviously not going to work really well. Right? I'm just going to fly randomly through space, hopefully not crash, but it's not going to be great. But what I do get from that is kind of data. Right? I get to see, ah, when I apply this control action, my robot went that way, something like this. And based on this, I can pick, uh, pick a new policy. So at the next iteration, I kind of given the data I've seen, I create some new policy. And this will hopefully do slightly better on the real system. And ideally, kind of in the limit, as I kind of learn more and more about the system, ideally, we would like to get to this really nice um, policy that just solves the tasks that we care about. And so for this, kind of to formalize this notion of we want to eventually solve the task um, that we care about, we need to have some kind of measure of convergence. And one thing that's really nice to have um, is to have the performance converge to the kind of optimal solution on average. Um, so let's kind of quickly parse this equation here. So um, if you look, um, can I, okay. Yeah, so um, basically on the right side here, uh, you can see um, J of F and pi star. So this is the performance or the expected performance of our optimal policy. 
if we knew the true dynamics. And on the left-hand side here, um, we have kind of for each iteration T, we um, have the performance of our, uh, the policy that we selected and we average over all T steps. So we just kind of, we add up the performances of all the um, policies that we've tried out so far um, and we divide by the total number of policies. So it's just the average performance of the policies we've tried so far. And in the limit, as t goes to infinity, we would like this to converge to the optimum. And that, what this means is that kind of over time, on average, we're trying policies that are better and better, right? So on, in the end, if the average value is equal to this year or is converging to that, then eventually we must really almost always try out optimal policies, right? Otherwise, there's no way for us for this average to be close to this because the performance at every step is clearly upper bounded by the optimal. So this is gonna be our notion of convergence then that on average kind of our policies get better over time. So notably this allows us a little bit of wiggle room for exploration. So we could try out really, really bad policies once in a while, as long as in the long run kind of on average, we're gonna be really, really good. And so this is gonna be some notion of convergence and this is something we would really like to have because if we can guarantee this, then we, can know, we know we can go to a system, we know we can apply our algorithm and eventually we'll find an optimal policy. All right, so that leaves only one uh, question, right? Like how do I actually pick these pi, t, uh, pi t's, right? Like how do I pick my control policies? And this turns out to be non-trivial. So you can spend a lot of time doing this. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do this. So for example, one way that completely ignores any kind of system modeling would be to just do some kind of gradient descent, right? You just try to estimate some gradient of your control parameters and you do gradient descent. That's not what this lecture is going to be out. So, about. So in this lecture, we will talk about how to do model-based reinforcement learning. And so we are actually going to try to learn a model of this physical system F, so this dynamics function F, and we'd also want to quantify uncertainty. And so in particular, what we're gonna use is any kind of model really, um, like we'll make this more precise in a bit, but in principle, every time we see trajectory data, we wanna rule out any kind of dynamics models that are not compatible with the data. So if you think about it kind of in the beginning, it could be whatever any continuous function or something like this, or any, any belief over my functions that I have. And then as I see a trajectory, I can rule out certain functions because they're just not compatible with the kind of data that I've seen. And then since we have noise, this becomes a little bit more tricky, um, but fundamentally at the end of the day, we really care about all the models that could potentially explain the data. And among those we'll have some uncertainty. So notably the set of kind of a function space or the kind of a set of models um, can also come from having some belief. So sometimes we'll write this kind of F tilde is distributed according to some probability distribution. Um, this is just gonna be a, st a stochastic belief. We'll see an example of this later, um, but you can kind of go from a stochastic belief to the set of models by thinking about kind of confidence intervals. So what's kind of a, a set of models that is the uh, kind of will contain the true model with high probability under my belief. And um, like I said, we'll see a concrete example of this uh, more than once throughout the lecture, but ultimately we want to take this belief over our system. So take all the models that could currently explain the data and then select a policy pi t that allows us um, to learn about the optimum. So it's informative about our learning process. All right, so this is the basic setup. Somehow we want to learn a system model. We want to quantify our uncertainty. So kind of given data, which model exists. And then we want to use that to actually solve our, the optimization problem that we care about. Now, this is really interesting because there's this really curious interaction between kind of how do I learn my model and how do I do exploration, All right? And how do I, how I do my model learning kind of affects my exploration and my convergence and likewise kind of depending on how I explore, I gather new data or not, and that affects my model learning. There's really this interesting interaction, and this will only get worse once we talk about safety. So right now, right, like this is just unconstrained optimization. We haven't talked about safety. We will, I promise, if we have time. And it's really a complicated setup. And somehow we need to go to a simpler setting to really understand this. And this is kind of the goal of this lecture is to really understand why this is all challenging and what are these interactions 
And for that, I would actually really like to first go to a simpler setting and we go back to the kind of the full model-based reinforcement learning setting. So let's make some simplifying assumptions that hopefully kind of keep the essence of the problem. So we're going to assume that we have a given deterministic initial state. So this is kind of already implicitly assumed in the slides, but that's um, gonna, gonna be one assumption that we make. We're gonna start with a super basic problem. So we're just gonna think about a single step optimization problem. So our time horizon is one, we're like really, really greedy. Then we're gonna make a really peculiar choice about, of our, about our objective. So we're just gonna assume that we want to maximize the state. So kind of right now we're in a one step um, policy optimization problem. And our goal is to maximize that state somehow. And then lastly, we're going to assume that our policy is just constant. So our policy is just this vector pi t of parameters that we pick. And based on those, we end up in some next state. So these are all really silly assumptions, and they don't really mean much in practice. But there's a reason for those. Namely, if you actually plug these three assumptions in, or these four assumptions, what you end up with is that this really complicated performance objectives that we had before, right? This expectation over the noise with like these multiple steps and the sum over the reward functions becomes really simple. Amy becomes actually just a function of these parameters, theta t, and it's equal to our kind of objective, evaluate our, our dynamics at this point, evaluated as zero and plugging in kind of the action theta t. So if you kind of, Want to actually follow this along, there's actually a derivation of this in a paper below in the appendix. Um, but right now, you'll just have to trust me that this is what happens. Right? We plug in the simplifying assumptions, and then we end up with this very specialized version of model-based reinforcement learning. But it's still going to have some of the interesting um, characteristics that actually make model-based reinforcement learning tricky. So it's actually a worthwhile problem to look at. And so if you ignore that we kind of derive this from F being our dynamics, you can actually think about this in a different way. So let's say um, we're going back to our kind of robot, our quadrotor, and we wanted to fly along this gray trajectory. And to do that, we have a control policy, pi, that depends on only these parameters theta t. So for example, these are the gains of your PID controller, the weights of your neural network, something like this. It's some fixed policy, and I'm just plugging in the parameters. And then I'm not actually going to think about modeling the dynamics of the system. I'm just going to think about what happens if I plug in one specific choice for theta t, and I try out what happens. So I get to see a trajectory, and I can quantify how well this trajectory did. Maybe I can just see kind of what was the tracking error, for example. And that's now going to be our objective. We just want to maximize um, the tracking error as a function of these parameters theta. So this is. So kind of for now, forget about that we derived this from model-based reinforcement learning and really just think about this as this particular problem where um, we kind of have this objective of maximizing performance based on some parameter vector that doesn't change over time, right? These are just parameters of our policy. And then for each parameter, I can try out what happens. I can see some um, trajectory and I just observe a noisy observation of J of theta. So I get to see a noisy evaluation of the performance of our system. Felix, you said you're trying to maximize tracking error. Uh, sorry, yeah. So uh, maximize performance. Ah, so another control it's machine checking. learning uh, thing, right? So typically, um, kind of in machine learning, you talk about maximizing rewards versus in control, kind of you're more pessimistic and you try to minimize costs. I guess one is a bit more optimistic than the other. So that's why we're sticking with um, rewards here. So we're <laughs> kind of trying to maximize the negative tracking error if you want, or minimize the tracking error. All right, but J is gonna be some kind of performance objective that we want to make larger. So for example, the negative tracking error. All right. So now we've simplified our problem quite a bit, kind of conceptually, right? There's some unknown performance function J that depends on the parameters theta that we pick. And we want to maximize that function. And then our kind of iterative procedure also simplified itself a lot, right? We just pick parameters theta t, not some whole policy function, but really just a, a vector. And then we get to see an observation, which I'm going to call yt, which is the true performance objective, j of theta t, plus some noise, right? So it's a it's a very simplified model-based reinforcement learning setting, except that it's no longer really model-based, right? We just have this performance objective J 
and the noise. But the key structure here is the same, right? So we still have this challenge that we don't know our performance objective, this function that maps parameters to performance. So we have epistemic uncertainty and we have noise. We have electoric uncertainty. We're going to do a similar thing to what uh, kind of I was proposing for model-based reinforcement learning. Namely, we're going to learn a model of J. In particular, we're going to take a Gaussian process model for this. Um, we'll see an instance of this in a second. And we're going to assume it's well calibrated. And we're going to see also what that means in a second. But really, the structure here is the same. right? So we have aleatoric uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty. And right now, we just want to somehow map, solve this very simpler optimization problem and hopefully learn something about model-based reinforcement learning in the process. All right, so here's a well-calibrated model. Um, so what you can see here is on the horizontal axis are input parameters, theta. So these are, for example, the parameters of your control strategy. On the vertical axis, that's the performance. This is what we want to maximize. And this gray function here that you can uh, hopefully see is um, the true function. So I don't know this, but uh, there is some true function that maps parameters to performance on my robot, just like there is some true dynamic system that I'm controlling. And now what you see is I've kind of tried to model this function. So I've kind of seen the, see this blue data point here. So this is what these crosses mean is an observation um, of J of theta at these corresponding parameters. And then I have a statistical model that uses this data in order to quantify kind of what is my, what are kind of all the models that are compatible with this. And here's kind of a simplified illustration of this. So what you see here, this blue function, that's just the expected value of my model. So think of this as the, the best guess of what does the true function look like. And then this blue shaded region here in the background is some measure of uncertainty. And in this particular instance, it's a Gaussian process model, um, which uh, specifically kind of models uncertainty as a function of how far apart kind of my data points are. So for example, here I have a data point. That means I'm really certain about the function. And then it generalizes based on kind of the distance from that data point. So once I go kind of too far away from my data, my uncertainty increases. And this is kind of an inherent property of this particular Gaussian process model. But I really don't want to dive into too much detail because the exact property of the model is not going to matter too much down the road for us. So what's nice about these kind of models is that as you see more data, you kind of become more certain about your model, right? So you can, every time you get an observation, your uncertainty shrinks, you get more confident about what's the true underlying model or set in a different way, you've kind of eliminated all the models that weren't really compatible with your data, right? Given a data point uh, at some point, it's really unlikely that the function value would really be far away from this because you've assumed kind of some properties of noise. So in particular here, we've kind of assumed, assumed Gaussian noise. And that means kind of contract really quickly. It's really unlikely that you're far away from that. And as you see kind of more and more data, you become more and more confident. So your uncertainty shrinks and your mean becomes a better estimate. So what does it mean now? I've talked about this well-calibrated model. And this is going to be a central assumption and kind of all of safe reinforcement learning really is that the assumption that the model is well calibrated. And really what that means is that you can trust your model to capture the reality well. And so kind of said in a different way, the confidence intervals of my model, so this shaded region, will always contain the true function with high probability. And so somehow I can trust the uncertainty that my model gives you to be kind of nicely behaved and capture the true underlying function. In practice, this is going to be a really strong assumption. So if you actually go out to a real robot, um, getting a model that really has this property is really challenging. But I also don't know what to do without this assumption. So somehow, in practice, we still need to know um, something about our system to really fulfill this assumption. Um, but we're just going to assume now that somebody gave us some learning model that fulfills this. And in so practice, there are like, I mean, you can approximate that. Yeah. So Felix, in terms of like why why this is a such a strong assumption to make, mm -hmm. um, my my first thought is when those parameters that you're choosing are something like the the gain that you put in your feedback controller, I could see how generally as you just uh, change that gain, your performance would change in a, like a Lipschitz continuous type of mm -hmm. way. Uh, but if your parameters are something that you're drawing just from from a neural network or something, as you mentioned, maybe not being confident that if you change the parameters slightly you will in fact be able to bound how much your performance changes. Is that the main issue or are there also other issues I'm not thinking of? 
Yeah, so that is the main issue, right? Like, so somehow you're making some, you need to make assumptions about this objective function J, um, which is kind of in conflict with our reinforcement learning setting of we know nothing about our system, right? Like, just throw me a quad rotor and I'll magically learn to control it, right? So somehow we need to make assumptions. Um, we can't just learn from scratch, right? Like, for example, let's say I give you a system that's completely discontinuous, something like this that just jumps around some kind of weird non physical system. I mean, it's unlikely that we can probably learn anything reasonable about this. And so we need to make assumptions about our model class. And Gaussian processes are one model. They're really good at modeling continuous functions in, let's say, reasonably low dimensional spaces. Um, neural networks are good for other things. So we'll actually see an example of using neural networks from uncertainty later, and that also works, um, but they're a bit less interpretable. So there are trade offs here about kind of what kind of model do you select? How do you quantify uncertainty? And they're all really interesting questions. Um, they're just not going to be really the focus of this lecture because we're going to kind of want to go further, right? For us, we just want to assume that somebody has done the hard work for us. Somehow we have a model that we can learn. And for us, the interesting question is now, what do we do with this, right? Like, how do we learn now, given that we can quantify uncertainty in our system? But yes, this is a super interesting question of how do we actually do this in practice? And yeah, uh, we will need another lecture for this at some point. Thanks. All right, so um, let's kind of actually put in math what I um, meant by well calibrated models. So there's this mean function, which we're going to call mu t minus one. So t minus one meaning conditioned on all the data we've seen so far. So in this case, we've seen one, two, three, four, five, six data points. And that means kind of there would be the mean after having seen six data points. And then we um, also have a, some confidence interval. So this is going to be some scalar beta t that we're just going to pick according to how much we believe our model um, times the standard deviation sigma t minus one and these are kind of the two central properties of our model in particular since we're using a gaussian process these are actually fully describing the marginals because the marginal distributions at each parameter they're also gaussians um, but really mathematically the property that we care about is that this true function this gray function here j of theta is really close to the mean. And this closeness is bounded by somehow the uncertainty that we have. So really, this is just a mathematical way of saying this gray line lies in the blue shaded region. And we want this to hold with some probability. So for example, greater than some threshold. And in particular, we want this to hold for all parameters theta and for all iterations. Now, so this can be tricky. Um, you, Depending on your model, this might actually not be possible either. Um, but for Gaussian processes and like a particular class of functions, um, this is actually possible. There's a really nice paper about this. Totally recommend reading this if you're into theory. This is a, a kind of really classical paper in um, this kind of space. I think that also won the test of time award. So it's kind of how to actually bound these uncertainties and how to use that for optimization. But for us right now, kind of where we're at is we can construct models that are well calibrated and we know what that means. Somehow the uncertainty bounds well kind of how, how far my best guess deviates from the true underlying function. All right, so we're back to our procedure. We now have a model that kind of quantifies uncertainty over J of theta. Let's kind of finally get to the part where we actually select parameters. So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to solve this optimization problem. And then I somehow drifted off, uh, off kind of talking about models. So how do we actually use this now to optimize? So that means we somehow need to explore, right? Like, so we need to select these parameters theta t. And so the very first thing you might be tempted to do is to just say, well, I have this best guess, right? I've called this best guess now multiple times, the mean of my model. So why don't I just take this best guess and pick parameters that maximize this? Right, in principle, that seems like a reasonable strategy. Well, if I maximize my best guess, I mean, how, how bad could things really get, right? So let's try out what happens. So this is, a, um, again, the kind of problem we have. We want to maximize this function, the performance. So this time, we're really in an interactive setting. And in particular, I've said we're going to select parameters that maximize the mean. So just the maximum of this blue function. And kind of I've, I've plotted this function here, this mu of t here at the bottom kind of as a scaled version. And that means we're kind of always going to pick parameters that maximize this function, right? And so if we actually do this and select a data point at this maximum here, we're going to see like 
<laughs> that mostly nothing happens. So the next data point is actually really close to the previous one. And the reason it's not exact is mostly because solving this optimization problem here, like selecting the maximum mean is also a bit noisy. So there's a little bit of noise, uh, which is enough to kind of eventually do like a little bit of exploration, but really we get stuck here, right? Like, so let me go back. In particular, we know kind of if we, this gray function has its maximum over here, right? On the right-hand side of the space. And somehow we've only explored on the left hand here because somehow we, we really ignored the uncertainty, right? We just said, take my best guess and maximize this. This is ignoring that my uncertainty is kind of telling me potentially on the right here, there could be really great functions, but I'm just gonna focus on kind of where I know things, right? Not just on this mean function. So just being greedy here and kind of just taking what you know so far is kind of not enough for exploration. So this is a bit sad, right? Like this would have been really nice if this worked, but somehow just taking what you know is not enough. Somehow we really need to exploit this uncertainty. And so there are two strategies that are kind of really famous in this field. And um, they're, one of them is optimism. So that's kind of pretending that uncertainty always works out in your favor. So you just pick the parameters that kind of optimistically, so given your uncertainty are the best. And since we're kind of in this very simple setting where we're just trying to maximize a function, um, we can just take the mean plus the standard deviation. So if you go back to this plot, this would be kind of the upper end of this um, blue shaded region, right? We're just kind of optimistically picking parameters. That's one of the strategies that's kind of known to provably converge. Um, and the other one is called Thompson sampling. And that's kind of the same thing, but randomizing over it. So you're kind of sampling one potential function from your belief over functions. And then you're gonna pretend that is the true function and maximize it. It's a really interesting strategy. Um, I really wanted to mention it for that reason, but we won't discuss this in detail because we kind of re really gonna focus on optimism this lecture and try to understand that because I think that's gonna be, it's gonna be better to kind of understand one method properly uh, and take it from there. But so if you're interested in this, uh, read up on Thompson sampling is also a really cool strategy and also provably works for this. So let's actually do this optimistic exploration. All right, so um, I said, that, like I said, we're gonna pick parameters theta t now um, that not only greedily optimize the mean, so not only this blue function, but we're also gonna consider the uncertainty. It's gonna be the mean plus some scalar times the uncertainty. So it's this, the upper end of this blue function. And again, I've kind of plotted this optimization problem here. And you can see kind of here where we have data, we actually, we don't really wanna pick that. And on the other hand, kind of where we haven't seen data, we're somehow really keen on picking data there. So if we follow this strategy, you can see that we're kind of really seeking out states where we're really uncertain with a twist that kind of as uncertainty decreases, eventually there are no more parameters kind of in the left side of our space that could potentially be better than what we've seen here. And we're just gonna kind of keep evaluating parameters close to the optimum. And th so this is now a strategy that actually converges and like provably converges. And so this is really nice. And we're gonna have a look at why this actually works because this is gonna be this is really the core of exploration, right? Somehow we need to use uncertainty in order to explore. And I've just written down this kind of optimistic framework, but it's actually super easy to understand why, or well, like the, the math is not uh, scary, let's say. Um, and the idea is really to somehow look at the parameters that we evaluate. So this is the theta t, which we pick as the maximum upper confidence bound. So right now this is kind of illustrated by this um, purple bubble here on the top. This is the point where the uncertainty plus the mean, so the upper edge of our confidence region is maximal. And these are kind of the parameters theta t that I pick at every iteration. And the other quantity we care about is um, j of theta star. So this is the true optimum that we don't know, but we somehow want to converge to. And so how could we go about kind of quantifying this gap, right? This gap between the parameters j theta t, uh, so this kind of the performance that we actually see when we evaluate our parameters and kind of this true optimum that we don't know about, right? If we could bound this gap somehow, that might allow us to actually show that this algorithm converges. And actually the math for this is actually really nice because it's somehow just using the fact that these confidence intervals work, right? So under the assumption that our model is well calibrated, we can start by looking at the performance of J of theta T. So the performance that we actually see, 
And we know that this must always be greater than this lower confidence bound. So this is this purple bubble here at the bottom. All right, so this is us saying that whichever parameters we try, they can at most, with high probability at least, they won't be any worse than the lower confidence bound on our function values. This is this purple bubble here at this um, here at the bottom. Similarly, we can do a similar trick for the optimal parameters. So we know that the uh, performance of the optimal parameters can at most be as good as the upper confidence bound. All right, so we can bound j of theta star here by the mean plus the confidence interval. And here comes kind of, so far, this is just really plugging in the confidence intervals, right? Right now, I've used nothing but the knowledge that my model is well calibrated, saying that any value I pick with high probability will not be any worse than the lower confidence bound, but it also most likely won't be better than my upper confidence bound. And the only clue now um, is uh, to notice that we pick parameters according to the maximum upper confidence bound. So that means this point here, so the, point, uh, the maximum of um, the optimal parameters will be smaller than my upper confidence bound of the parameters that I pick. And that means I can replace theta star here by theta t. And now I suddenly have a lower bound for j theta t, then upper bound for kind of the optimal parameters that depends on theta t. And if I plug those in, I get a really simple equation, meaning that at each iteration, if I pick parameters that maximize the upper confidence bound on my function, um, the gap between the optimal performance and the performance of the parameters I pick is just bounded by the uncertainty of my parameters. Right? So I've picked theta t, I have some uncertainty. And just by the matter of the fact that we pick optimistic parameters, we somehow get this bound that says, well, if my uncertainty here were low, then I would know that I'm really close to the optimal parameters. And the clue now is that as I get more and more data, I kind of know that my uncertainty shrinks, right? Every time I get a data point, my uncertainty will shrink. And so there's quite a bit of extra math now to show this, but the core idea really is to show that just by being optimistic, we know that at, we are at most as far away from the optimum as the uncertainty of these parameters. And then kind of we know that over time, the uncertainty shrinks. Um, you need to quantify how quickly that happens to really give guarantees. But the core idea really is uncertainty bounds how far away I'm from the optimum. And uncertainty shrinks over time as I collect data. So eventually, I will converge. So it's a, somehow a very intuitive proof, right? I'm just always thinking uncertainty works out in my favor. And now the clue is that due to this neat trick that I'm always optimistic, I can also give you a bound on how far away I'm from the optimum. This is a really kind of cool trick um, and like a reason why optimism is kind of a favorite algorithm um, because it's like the core idea is really simple. Right. Uh, I'm sure there are questions about this. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I don't know on the right, the most right equations, how this uh, second inequality holds, why the mu zeta t is, uh, is greater and plus the beta zeta t is greater than the optimal zeta. Um, because we pick theta t to be the maximum, right? Like if this was not true, then I would have picked different parameters here, right? Like I pick theta t uh, to be the maximum on this right-hand side. So for any other parameters, including the optimum ones, my upper bound must be greater. So what is theta star means then? Theta star are the optimal parameters, right? Like this optimum that I eventually, the optimum of this gray curve, right? Like the optimum of this true function. Um, function that I don't know yet. The function that I want to optimize, but that I don't know. I see. Okay. So j of theta is kind of the the true function, and mu and sigma are kind of my uncertainty or my model for this function. So how we guarantee the zeta t is the global optimal? I mean, I've said nothing about this. I've just said that whenever I pick theta t, I'm at most as far away from the optimum as I'm uncertain about my model. And then I made a hand wavy argument that as I collect data here on the right-hand side, you can see it, my uncertainty shrinks. Mm -hmm. And that means kind of, if I keep doing this, eventually there's no more place for me to be really uncertain, right? Like the maximum, at some point I will converge, right? Like this is, it, it's a bit tricky and untechnical to show this, but somehow since every time you get data, you get more information about your model necessarily, somehow your uncertainty will shrink over time. Like I can't keep evaluating parameters that are super uncertain. 
So yes, this was this part is a little bit hand wavy, and you just need to trust me that <laughs> uncertainty okay. shrinks and models generalize. But um, somehow it makes sense, right? Like we collect data, we get uncertain, uh, we we kind of decrease uncertainty. So at some point there will be no point left for us to to evaluate that's really uncertain and has a, a kind of the, this property that we're selecting to the upper confidence bound. Mm -hmm. I also had a question uh, in terms of how. Uh, we can easily find the global optimum of uh, theta t. Like, like how, how can we uh, maximize that function of mu plus uh, beta times sigma? Um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of the, I guess, the part that I skipped over. I'm just going to assume that we can solve this. I mean, this is now a model. This is, doesn't require an experiment on the real system. It's just a model of the system. And um, we could, in principle, do even grid search or something like this. But in practice, people just do, uh, let's say, sample a bunch of points at random and uh, try to do gradient descent, uh, descent from there. Um, you could do more principled things. You could um, kind of exploit that this function is Lipschitz continuous and do any kind of other global optimization. But um, yeah, you're just going to throw some kind of data hungry optimization method at that. Um, because ultimately, we just care about being if data efficient on our evalu evaluations of J of theta t. OK, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, regarding how you find theta t based on each iteration, each iteration you can, what you can do is doing the great research, like uh, Dr. Felix just mentioned, uh, space, and then um, you compute the mean mu of theta t plus, plus the confidence interval for all of the points. So, so basically, just uh, so grid search is a like a well recognized way to do that. It, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like the reachability. Um, so you you have you mm. cannot you cannot handle the your um, object function with high high dimension nanity. So um, you have to do a, a low dimensional space because uh, the grid points increase uh, exponentially as your dimension of your problem increases. Okay. So um, okay, yeah, I see. Uh, so so if theta is kind of high dimensional, it can be even harder or more computationally expensive to compute yes. this theta yes, t for yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And actually, I have one more question. It's mm -hmm. regarding with beta. So you bound your j of theta star with j of theta t uh, less than two multiplied beta multiplied. Um, sigma. Oh, wait, the two, the two is random. No, ignore the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, wait, no, no, yeah. that's uh, this two. Yeah, yeah, no, that's correct. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, and we know that uh, sigma of theta t is actually really small because you have already sampled uh, theta t at this point. But uh, I actually have a question about how you bound beta because when you we are trying to um, do exploration, actually, we have to increase beta as we uh, iterate. Uh, and then um, could you please give a little bit general idea of how we bound beta e eventually? Mm -hmm. um, so you're absolutely right. So I wrote beta th uh, t. And for the theory to hold, right, we somehow want these confidence intervals to not only hold for parameters, but also for all time steps. Now, the problem is we don't know how many time steps there are. And uh, I mean, this is now a technicality, right? If I told you how many time steps there are, I could just kind of distribute some budget for each round. But since I don't know how many rounds there are, I somehow need to distribute a budget of these beta t's um, that kind of holds true independent of how many iterations I have. And that's the reason that beta t typically increases. So there's a, there's a nice mathematical hack. I think this is kind of very early in the appendix of the paper here at the bottom um, that shows you kind of how to uh, pick these um, so that this actually works out kind of beta t is just a budget of how often do I want this probability to kind of be um, kind of how high do I want the probability to be that the confidence intervals hold at one iteration, like at iteration t. And then the, the sum of those is somehow the probability budget over all rounds. And how to bound this and how to exactly pick this, uh, we're kind of already like uh, way later on time than I imagined. Um, but uh, if you're really interested in this in the read the paper, or if um, the paper is unclear, um, just uh, ping me and write me an email. I'm happy to talk about this. Um, for now, it's a it's a property that depends on our model. That's maybe the the most I want to kind of say at this point. Thank you so much. Kind of drifting off. All right. So bandits, 
we, we wanted to do model-based reinforcement learning. So far, we've just done bandits. But uh, we've learned a couple of lessons, right? So greedy doesn't work. So if there's um, kind of uncertainty, somehow just being greedy about what I know so far will get me stuck in some local optimum. Um, uncertainty allows us to kind of avoid that, to actually do principled exploration. And optimism is one way to do that in a provably convergent way. All right, so this is all great. Um, I started talking about like robots and model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, can we please get back to that? Yes, back to the problem. Okay, so um, this is exactly as, uh, the same as the first slide. Um, we somehow want to solve this optimization problem. And now the only difference is um, I'm modeling uncertainty about my dynamics F. So I have some model F tilde and I have some um, no longer have kind of just a parameter vector. I mean, I can in practice, but I'm really optimizing over policies here, about over policies that kind of select the action that I apply to my system, depending on the state. And greedy is actually a really popular exploration scheme for uh, model-based reinforcement learning, even though we've just seen that um, a special case doesn't work, right? So we saw that bandits are a special case of model-based reinforcement learning. And we saw that greedy doesn't work there. This is already like really interesting because that means we know that this will not be enough, or at least not in general, right? We saw that if we have a, a bandit problem, it doesn't work, it's a special case. Hence, we can conclude that greedy will not solve model-based reinforcement learning in general. However, uh, that's not true always, right? So this is really cool paper by Ben Recht. Um, it's a bit technical, but I certainly recommend reading it if you're interested. It actually shows that this is not true, for example, for linear quadratic systems. And this is also the reason, or I assume that this is the reason why a lot of papers that kind of come from control that kind of do safety and then um, kind of do greedy optimization, they still work because they're somehow close to this linear quadratic setting. But in principle, we can always find an instance where this will fail. And we'll see an instance of this in a second. Then uh, optimism has a natural analog here. Um, so we could just kind of be optimistic over all the dynamics models that we've selected and kind of try to ma maximize this. So it's now a max-max problem that we want to solve. If you plug in the bandit assumptions, um, again, kind of you're just maximizing then over this one-step function, which just happens to be equal to the upper confidence interval. And then there's also Thompson sampling, which I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but those uh, two actually converge. And so they, they provably converge. So unfortunately, that's not really the, the end of the story because this is like a practicality question here, right? Like, so this greedy algorithm, I've said like lots of people do this. And the reason for this, it's really easy to solve this. We're really good at solving this. So it's when kind of most reinforcement learning algorithms just try to solve this problem here. So this is super easy to implement. Here, I have to maximize over all my dynamics models, which might be tricky. And here I have to sample kind of a dynamics model which also can be tricky. So it works uh, if you have a kind of, uh, kind of parametric uncertainty, but for these non-parametric models, this also takes quite a bit of effort to do. So these, these two methods are quite a bit more tricky to implement, um, but we're gonna see kind of one neat trick to make optimism practical in this setting too. All right, so we want to be optimistic about dynamics models somehow. And we've just concluded that this is really challenging, right? That's, how, like, how do I maximize over a function in my, in some somehow set, right? That sounds tricky. So we're gonna make a, a really simple uh, assumption here, or like really simple uh, generalization of this problem. Maybe we're gonna kind of exploit again that our model is well calibrated. So our dynamics are never far, further away from the mean than some version of my confidence intervals. And we can just reparameterize this and write our functions as the mean plus my uncertainty times some other function, right? So this is now a more general class of functions because I've kind of, I'm, I'm allowing my function to switch from one state to another within my confidence intervals, but it is a way of expressing uncertainty. And concretely, the way you can think about it is that given some initial state, I am a kind of following the mean together with some policy, pi of t, right? Like that's telling me my mean is pointing me somewhere and then I have some uncertainty attached to it. This is a blue shaded region. And now this function eta allows me to move anywhere within this uncertainty. So really these are somehow optimistic dynamics where I'm saying I have an extended action space, 
So I'm no longer just acting on the actions on my system, but I have kind of additional inputs that I, so additional policy eta that allows me to move optimistically within the uncertainty that I have over my one step predictions. So this is the clue, right? To rather than optimizing over models, I've somehow reduced this now to like a greedy problem over optimistic dynamics. So I now just have an extended policy that I can plug in and I can optimize that. And what I get out by optimizing over optimistic dynamics is an optimistic policy. So what does this look like actually in practice? So this was a, a paper by, by a colleague of mine, which is. Um, so here, what we see is a kind of a super simple example, namely an inverted pendulum. And one on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you can kind of see what um, our algorithm is planning. So it's starting here kind of at minus 180 degrees. So our pendulum is kind of downwards and it's planning this optimistic trajectory that's just violating all of physics is going straight upwards, right? Like there's no, there's no angular velocity, so no vertical axis. I'm just vertically going to my optimum, right? So it's completely ignoring physics because it's optimistic about the uncertainty, right? It's assuming like, oh, I have uncertainty in my model. I'm just optimistically gonna walk straight through this space and this is gonna be fine. If you roll this out in practice, um, you see this trajectory here, right? Like obviously nothing happens, right? I've been really stupid. I just assume physics doesn't apply to me because I'm just such an optimistic character here. And clearly that doesn't work. But what happens is that I collect interesting data. So I'm actuating the system and I'm kind of collecting data over it. So already at the next iteration, you can see that kind of the optimistic trajectory that we're planning looks a bit more physical. So there's some kind of swing up happening and then eventually, okay, I'm just violating physics again, that's fine. Um, but we're getting really close, right? So it's after just three, uh, three episodes. And then as I get more and more data, eventually these trajectories get more and more realistic, closer and closer to kind of what my real system looks like. And eventually we can actually solve this task. And this is now actually using a neural network or like an ensemble of neural networks to represent uncertainty. Um, and you can still kind of see that this, this optimism can actually solve these kind of tasks. And so I, I told you that greedy doesn't work. And so here's an example of when uh, to actually demonstrate this. So this is a really famous reinforcement learning benchmark. It's called the half cheetah. It's not super challenging. It looks super challenging. It's actually not, uh, but it makes nice videos, which is why people like it. Um, and we're gonna kind of take this algorithm. So this is UCRL for upper confidence reinforcement learning and an H for hallucinated because we kind of have this hallucinated inputs. And if we apply this, we kind of converge really quickly. If we do greedy, we also converge, but we can see kind of that the, um, it takes quite a bit longer. So we're a bit slower to converge actually. And um, Thompson sampling also works, um, works slightly worse because we don't actually have a probability distribution, which is pretending that kind of our ensemble is one. So ignore Thompson sampling, but we can see that kind of even in the standard setting, we do slightly better. And now what's interesting is that these reinforcement learning benchmarks typically don't have action costs, which is, if you think about it, not something that what a control person would normally do, right? Like when we write down or control people write down an objective, there's typically some penalty on actions. And what happens if you actually introduce action costs is that suddenly things start to fail. So you can see that the greedy algorithm suddenly no longer performs as well, right? It gets stuck. And if you increase action costs even more, basically the greedy method doesn't work anymore. And the reason for this is that the greedy method really also averages over our epistemic uncertainty, right? I'm not only averaging over the noise in my performance objective, but also over my epistemic uncertainty. And now if I have action costs, it actually turns out that the optimal action is often to do nothing at all, right? If I don't know anything about the system and I'm treating everything that I don't know as noise, then it just seems like an extremely stochastic system. So I have no hope of controlling this. And since I have action costs, the best thing is to just do nothing at all. And so what you can see here is that these methods are really optimized. If, I, if I'm greedy and ignoring uncertainty and I have action penalties, then I'm really kind of counteracting this kind of random exploration that normally happens if I don't have action penalties. So it's really cool. And it's, uh, it's actually a trend that you see on lots of different environments. Um, but maybe we don't need to talk about all of them. But so the key takeaways here is exploration also matters in model-based reinforcement learning. 
optimism can be applied here too for the same kind of ideas, right? Like I'm optimistic about my performance, um, kind of I then kind of collect interesting data. And the next time I'm also gonna um, kind of select a new trajectory and over time my uncertainty will shrink and I converge to the optimum. You can actually see that this can improve data efficiency a little bit. And uh, kind of normally what you do is you do some kind of reward shaping to avoid this issue with the action costs. So maybe that's a way to do a bit less of that. All right. So this is model-based reinforcement learning. We haven't talked about safety at all. And so what happens here is I've just solved an opti optimal control problem, right? I've just written down some convergence guarantees, but I haven't said anything about safety. And in particular, an optimistic robot is probably the last thing you want to have in a lab. Like imagine like a flying robot that just pretends every time it doesn't know something that it's great to go there, right? Like walls don't exist. Let me try out that. Maybe I can collect reward there. That's probably not something that you want. And so now finally, we can go to safe reinforcement learning. And so we have about 20 minutes left, if I see this correctly. Um, it's probably not gonna be quite enough time. So um, let's actually take some questions. Um, kind of, has, has this kind of been clear, kind of how optimism helps us with exploring and kind of why greedy can fail? I'm going to take this as a no. Um, all right, any, come on, somebody must have a question here. All right, so instead of silently uh, staring at each other then, um, let's talk about safety. So this is now um, an extension of this problem, right? So instead of just wanting to converge to the optimum, we also want to ensure safety. So that means rather than just optimizing performance at every step, we want to make sure that my um, states, for example, satisfy some boundary conditions. So for example, to go back to our initial example, I want my quadrotor to fly towards the target, but I also have an obstacle like a wall in there in the middle. And so now what I want to do is I want to pick it, still want to pick an initial policy, but I want to make sure that that doesn't crash into this wall on the right-hand side. And I want to keep doing this kind of for all the iterations, right? I always want to make sure that whichever policy I pick, I'm kind of guaranteed not to enter this red shaded region. All right, so wh why is this super challenging? Like why, why is this much more complicated than the original problem? So ignoring the fact that now this is clearly a constrained optimization problem and just pretending we can solve that. Um, even so, it's super interesting how this interacts with the exploration. So let's say this is our state space and we start at some initial state. And again, we want to go to some goal and there is some kind of obstacle. All right, so one thing that one could do is to be pessimistic about the uncertainty in our model, right? So, so we want to make sure that no matter the uncertainty in my model, I never want to crash in that obstacle. And this is typically what you mean by when people say like a safe policy or a robust policy is saying that for all the uncertainty in my model, I make sure I don't crash into that wall. Now, the problem is that if I have such a trajectory that might not overlap with the optimal trajectory, right? So I have uncertainty in my model. And so being pessimistic about safety might mean I never actually go to uh, regions of the state space where the optimal um, safe policy, like kind of that if I, if I knew the dynamics perfectly, then I would kind of get this optimal policy and I might not actually ever get there, right? Like I might actually, by using a robust or safe policy, I might actually never collect data that allows me to learn about this problem. And this is actually what happens in practice. So you can actually um, show this that just combining safety with like an existing exploration scheme is typically not going to work. And, and so in particular, rather than just this interaction between exploration and model learning, now there's this third component that kind of interacts with everything, right? Like safety, now by having be, to be pessimistic about uncertainty to ensure safety, 
Um, that's going to limit on where we can explore. That's the one component. And on the other hand, this limitation of where we can explore is also going to affect model learning. And then our model affects the safety. So somehow we're now in this triangle relationship that's even more complicated than what we had before. And I would actually say, let's go back to bandits because there these things actually can also be understood and the same kind of problems show up. So we're in the same setting as before. We're in this uh, simple setting where you just want to maximize performance, but now we have an obstacle. So we want to make sure that we don't violate the safety constraint and we're going to formalize this as some function g of theta, just a function that depends on the parameter that should be greater than zero. So for example, let's say g of theta is the minimum distance um, along our trajectory to the wall. And that would just mean that for trajectory, I can determine how safe was I. So this is my safety constraint. So just to clarify the setup here, we pick parameters theta t. And on the one hand, we see how good did I be, uh, my robot behave? So I get to see the performance, j of theta t, but I also get to see the safety constraint. And this is again an iterative loop. And our goal is to maximize performance subject to the safety constraint and to never violate the safety constraint during the learning process. All right. So this is um, what's kind of generally called a constrained Bayesian optimization. So it's a more complicated setup what we had before. We have two functions. We have a performance objective and we have the safety constraints. And these are again kind of the true functions that I don't know in advance. And I um, have some safety threshold. So this is the zero level as we had before. And I always want to make sure that whatever parameters I evaluate, my function kind of takes values above here. So my parameters are safe. And again, I kind of have Gaussian process models uh, to model this uncertainty. Um, and initially kind of without data, they're just gonna tell me my function lies somewhere, right? Like everything is unsafe. So one thing that you're gonna see all the time if you look at uh, kind of doing safe learning is that you need some form of initial knowledge, right? You can't just start uh, learning safely if you don't even know what the very first thing that you do, um, whether that's going to be safe or not. So think about this, right? Like I just throw you some robot, like the controls and it's like, here, let's, let's fly this. It's probably not going to work, right? Somebody needs to at least tell you how to control that system a little bit. And then you can kind of start, once you can kind of make a robot hover or something, you can start exploring more and more and learn more about the system. And so whatever you say, kind of we need, uh, we do safe learning, there's gonna be some amount of prior information. And for us right now, we're just gonna take this as a safe starting point. So somebody gives me parameters that are known to be safe. So kind of we've collected here one data point. So we get one observation of the performance, one of the safety. And given that, we can look at the confidence intervals of our model so the lower confidence bound being pessimistic about our safety constraint. And we can kind of make sure that all these parameters in, the, in this red set here, they would most likely be safe, right? Because we know that if we were pessimistic about the uncertainty in our model, we'd still get something that's safe. We would still not violate the safety constraint. All right, so somehow like in, in Bayesian optimization, at least safety is super easy because I just need to check uh, since I'm in a one-step setting, I just need to check is my lower confidence bound on my safety constraint bigger than some threshold. And so here, um, the question is still like, how should I explore? And the very first thing that might come to mind is to kind of do some variant of safe optimism, right? Like we've, we've seen that optimistic exploration works, provably so in, uh, in this particular setting. We've also seen it works in model-based reinforcement learning. So why don't I just throw some safety constraints on that and surely things will just work, right? Like how bad could it possibly get? So all I'm doing is I'm now optimistic about my objective. And I'm gonna be pessimistic on the safety, right? And this is what you see quite frequently, right? Like, so I have some reinforcement learning problem and I'm just gonna add safety constraints. And now we're just in a very simplified setting where we're gonna say, let's take an algorithm that has provable exploration guarantees, but be pessimistic on safety. And so here is an example of this. So we're going to evaluate the, uh, take the parameters that have the maximum upper confidence bound, but at the same time are safe. So in this red set. And if I run this algorithm, you can see that initially it looks super promising, but eventually it just gets stuck in this local optimum here on the left. All right. So in particular, I know that there is this safe optimum here on the right, but somehow my algorithm never goes there. It never explores. 
Right, so something clearly broke just by taking an algorithm that we know can solve this problem without safety constraints and just slapping on safety constraints somehow wasn't enough. Right, so somehow I'm by just exploring where parameters are safe, there's no incentive really to explore anywhere outside. And this is uh, kind of the kind of maybe the, the key takeaway, I would say, is that um, somehow in order to ensure exploration in the safe set, we need to somehow really actively think about learning about the safety constraint. So it's not just enough to take kind of any reinforcement learning algorithm and throw safety on top, but that can really destroy your safety guarantee, uh, your exploration guarantees. So the, the clue here is, again, bandits are a special case of model-based reinforcement learning. And we've just shown by example, at least, that um, an algorithm that had exploration guarantees didn't work. And as a consequence of that, just adding safety constraints to a normal reinforcement learning um, algorithm will also not work in general. Again, there are exceptions. There's a, of course, there's a paper by Ben Richt for this in the, in the linear setting. This is actually not true. Again, in the linear quadratic setting, this can actually be enough. But in the general setting, this will not work. So it's not a general reinforcement learning algorithm, if you want. So what is? So how could we kind of now actually do exploration? Right? So I said, somehow we need to learn about the safe set actively. And one way to do this is to just ignore about my objective altogether, right? To just query parameters where I'm the most uncertain. This uh, maybe is a little bit naive, but um, this is some form of active learning where I'm just collecting parameters that are most uncertain, again, subject to the safety constraints. So I'm again selecting parameters that are within this red set, but this time I'm just gonna select the parameters that are the most uncertain. So I'm just maximizing the uncertainty and that's clearly going to work, right? Like, so I'm, since I want to learn about the function everywhere, there is some incentive for my algorithm to go towards the boundary of my safe set. And that really allows us to, to explore over time. So it's clearly not a great algorithm for um, optimization in general, but it does work actually, right? Because we know that like the uncertainty of our optimum is kind of upper bounded by the uncertainty of the parameters that we select because we select the parameters like this, at least within the safety set and the safe set. And some of this uncertainty on the right-hand side decreases towards zero as we collect more data. So at least in this setting, by learning about the function everywhere, we can guarantee some form of exploration. And unfortunately, this is also the only thing that's really known to work so far. So this is now where we've kind of reached the part where kind of very close to the end of the lecture, we're getting to the point where uh, I don't know what the answer is. Namely, this is the best thing we have right now, is methods that on the one hand kind of combine optimism with some amount of general exploration or not optimism specifically, but somehow combining uh, some notion of exploration with some amount of just exploration everywhere. And I'm actually not aware of any paper outside of the kind of special, set, uh, special settings for the linear quadratic case that um, show this, like how to, um, how to explore with um, kind of in a principled way without somehow relying on doing some amount of just uncertainty sampling. So let me show one concrete example of an algorithm does, that does this. So this is, uh, I think a paper from two years ago. And um, the idea is to kind of combine optimism. So kind of take some optimistic safe set and then use pure exploration to learn about the safety of kind of this optimistic action. So concrete example here. So we have again, our pessimistic safe set in our state space. We have kind of an optimistic set of all the things that could be safe. And then we select kind of a normal, like using whatever UCB, so for these normal exploration algorithms, we select parameters to explore about in this set, and then try to learn about their safety by focusing exploration in this area. I don't really want to dive into detail because I'm not. I'm really not convinced that these algorithms are really what we want to do down the road because they, I mean, they're just a hacky way of combining this explore everywhere with um, some amount of uh, kind of directed exploration in that setting. But really the idea is using this property that exploring everywhere kind of helps us to guarantee optimality down the road. And then somehow 
directing that towards interesting points. And if you do something like this, um, you can actually show that you can construct algorithms that actually work really well. Right, so, so here is now an algorithm that actively tries to explore and um, we actually converge. Um, so if you're interested about this, you can read more about it, um, but we're really not there. So here's some references and there's a, um, there's a longer talk about kind of these uh, safe exploration methods, but really we, I, I would say we're not quite there yet, right? So we're just somehow exploiting the fact that learning about the function everywhere in the worst case allows us to make some statement about uh, safe exploration, but then it, I would really like to have an algorithm that doesn't need this. So with that, actually, let me squeeze in one video of this uh, an algorithm like this actually running on a real system. So this is um, now a quadrotor that has the task to fly from left to right as quickly as possible. So just minimizing um, error to that point. And the bottom right, you can see kind of the model that we're building of the performance of a quadrotor. And so you can see kind of over time, we're kind of selecting parameters that on one hand are safe. So here were safety constraints. It was actually uh, on the performance. So that kind of, we don't want to do too badly on solving this problem. And we're kind of selecting informative parameters that um, on the one hand are safe. And on the other hand, allow us to learn about the optimum of this um, controller on this particular robot. And by doing this over time, we actually converge to a controller that is close to optimal and do so safely. And so you can see kind of without ever making this robot crash and there were parameters in the optimization set that do make this robot crash. Um, without ever making it crash, we can actually optimize it. Um, you can take this further. So for example, you can kind of come up with neat new tasks. And if I skip on the kind of do exploration in that setting, um, you can actually see kind of the uh, different robots for like kind of different optimized um, velocities. And you can really use these algorithms to kind of safely optimize. So this is just in the bandit setting, um, kind of algorithms for this. So with one minute left, um, so safety is kind of easy um, in the sense that we just have to be pessimistic about uncertainty. I mean, then we still have a constrained optimization problem that's in practice really difficult to solve, but conceptually that's not, or like that, at least we would know what to do. But just adding safety constraints to existing algorithms is unfortunately often not enough, right? So even in like simple bandit settings that can really destroy their convergence guarantees. And so if we really want to get to the setting where we just take a robot and eventually it learns what to do on its own, we really need to figure out how to do that well. So pure exploration is one trick to actually make that work. Um, but is data inefficient, <laughs> uh, not efficient, right? Like, so you're just learning about the function everywhere. Um, that's not really what you want in practice. Um, one solution is to combine actually exploration algorithms with some amount of pure exploration in a kind of clever way. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Hopefully we'll come up with something better down the road. And we don't have time for uh, safe learning robots, but um, I can already say that this is largely still an open problem. So outside of special settings, so for example, for this linear quadratic setting that I mentioned, where you have a linear system and quadratic costs, there it turns out that um, you can do safe exploration. And it turns also out that uh, just having noise is enough because linear systems are just really nice in that sense that they, they like you can learn about them system by just adding random noise. And if you really want to have safety and exploration guarantees, typically you have to, these papers still use some amount of uncertainty sampling, right? So for example, this very last paper that I linked here, does some combination of um, kind of performance together with some amount of just collecting information about my system everywhere. But um, we'll see, maybe we'll come up with something better. So the conclusion. So if we want to go to really real world applications, um, we can't really take these off the shelf reinforcement learning algorithms, but we really need algorithms that are both data efficient and safe. Right? And like, if we don't have either of those, we're really gonna have a problem of going to real world systems. And then a good way to really make sure that we're both data efficient and safe is to model uncertainty about our systems. Right? Uncertainty on the one hand allows us to make really informed decisions of where to collect data. And on the other hand, allows us to 
um, be safe, right? To, by being pessimistic about the uncertainty in our model. Um, there's a difference between aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. So this is super crucial. If you treat kind of epistemic uncertainty as noise, sometimes, not every time, but sometimes things are not gonna work. Um, expiration actually matters. So we've seen that both in theory and in practice, if you don't really think about expiration, things might not work out. Um, this add-on thing I mentioned, then um, if we just do kind of pure expiration, then we know that kind of we can also learn about safety in a kind of convergent way, but we also learn about a lot about kind of stuff that we don't really care about, right? Like we might learn about the dynamics of our model in a region where we really don't care about it to actually solve our optimal control problem. And so the conclusion really here is that safe model-based reinforcement learning is kind of really relevant in practice. It's actually a super interesting problem because it works at the intersection of kind of control statistics, like how do I learn a model and actually exploration, so machine learning. And I would say it's not yet solved. So if you're looking for a research topic, totally recommend. You can spend a lot of time on these kind of uh, fun little problems. And with that, I am at the end. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to answer any of those. Or um, if you have questions now, we can also cover those. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Felix. Um, everyone, if you have to get going, please go ahead and get going. Uh, otherwise, we can ask a couple of questions. I have a very, very quick, just like a practical question. For the example of the quadcopter where you're flying it, you're testing out different um, policies and seeing whether or not they're safe. How are you like measuring level of safety there? Yeah, so in this super simple example, it was just a constraint on the performance, kind of, I don't want my tracking error to get too large. Um, in the kind of example where the robots were flying in circles, it was a bit more complicated. So there was actually a constraint on um, kind of um, the angle of the robot. Um, like I don't, I don't want to have like too high angular velocity. So it was actually an onboard camera that was filming. I didn't show that video, but kind of had a constraint that that camera wasn't allowed to uh, wobble too much uh, so that we still get a nice video out at the end. Um, so in principle, these can be anything. Of course, there's always the problem if you do these Bayesian optimization style methods where you don't really model the dynamics, but you model the objective and your safety constraints directly as a mapping from parameters to that function. You have to put a little bit of thought into whether this, con this function is actually continuous and whether you can really learn it well. Right, so sure. while the, the goal is kind of to have these black box methods that we can just throw at it, right? And that's maybe what you would write in your next grant proposal or something like this. Um, that's not really where we're at right now, right? So you, that's what I meant, like for when we, in safety, you always need to have some prior knowledge because if I just give you some system and I tell you nothing about it, chances are you're not gonna be able to safely control that. And so this is just part of the prior knowledge that we need. We need to make assumptions about our systems. We could in principle make no assumptions and still use a Gaussian process but then we're not just not going to learn anything, right? Like if we say we allow our functions to be discontinuous everywhere, then there's no hope of generalizing, right? Because the discontinuity could just happen to be the very next parameter. And so assumptions are critical for data efficiency. They're critical for safety. Um, but in practice, if you know your system a little bit, you can often make reasonable assumptions. Uh, I had a question regarding like uh, some like let's say some outliers or some violations of assumptions. Assumptions. So if mm -hmm. you're manipulating, let's if you're learning to manipulate, let's say, uh, and you're trying to like move a cup, but in some instances, like uh, on first contact, you knock the cup off the table, right? Then you have this giant discontinuity in your mm -hmm. safety, but it may be an outlier scenario. So how would you handle that, or how would you handle learning in such a scenario? All right. So this goes back to the assumptions. So the assumptions to actually make these things work are in effect saying that our functions are continuous or at the very least Lipschitz continuous. So that kind of rules out these kind of hard contacts or something like this. So, so I showed you this um, Mujoko environment of this half cheetah running. That's actually not discontinuous, right? So Mujoko actually smooths out everything. So these are smooth systems everywhere. Um, it's actually fully differentiable if you wanted to do that. Um, which also makes these tasks so easy to solve. Right? So that's why these methods work because yeah, we have some smoothness properties. We don't have discontinuities. As soon as you have these kind of events where you can really knock something over and you have these discrete changes. So really like a hybrid system, 
um, then you need to ask uh, your professor. She will be happy to tell you all about those kind of systems and <laughs> hybrid systems and these kind of things. Thanks. Somal does have some new work that he's working on, on on safety through the hybrid systems and safe exploration, maybe like transport to different dynamics. But anyway. Yeah, so um, should invite him too. I mean, it's a super interesting problem. There are lots of, like, I mean, if, I, even I would say even in the kind of this easy, smooth setting, we do, we're not quite there yet, right? So we can, right now we're at the point where we can either guarantee safety or we can make statements about does my reinforcement learning algorithm converge under the assumption that my model is correct in both settings. Yeah. And the point is that this intersection of the two is really not quite well understood yet. And there are like a bunch of people working on this and it's, I mean, we're getting really nice results and more and more people working on this, but there's still some really interesting open questions. And that's why I'm saying it's a, it's a nice area for research if you're, if you're looking for an area to work in. Nikhil and Yuhang are the ones that I mentioned to you who are thinking about safety with surgical robots. So where you don't wanna like pierce someone's heart and how do you know how much you can push against their heart before that happens? Yep, that certainly <laughs> sounds safety critical. Yeah. Um, one, one more kind of quick question is, uh, you kind of mentioned that the bal like balancing safety and optimization is probably not the direction to go, I was wondering, like, kind of, why why that stance, and also, like, do you think the approach is like completely orthogonal to that, or like a completely new methodology, or? So I don't think it's going to be super orthogonal. I mean, also, if you look at what happened in um, kind of what kind of algorithms are we applying in model based reinforcement learning, they're effectively the same algorithms that we've used for bandits, right? So the algorithms where we've gained intuition in like simple systems, and then yeah, we tried them on the complicated system and you can make them probably work there too. So I, I don't think there's gonna be anything like magically of like, there's something in the super complicated system that we didn't think of in the simple case that somehow seems unlikely and not really how these things work in practice. So I think like looking at these simple examples like Bayesian optimization, safe Bayesian optimization, I think we need to think a bit about them. And once we understand them better, we're probably gonna also hopefully, I mean, this is purely speculation, right? I don't have the answer, but I, I would just be really disappointed if it turns out that the solution to safe exploration is to have some guarantee that you're exploring everywhere eventually. That just seems a bit, I don't know, theoretically a bit disappointing, right? Like, because I suddenly have to learn about things that I don't actually care about to solve my task um, just to make the convergence guarantees work. I would hope you can do better. Um, what you said, like, I mean, it's always going to be about balancing kind of exploration, exploitation, right? Like, so it's just a more challenging task where I'm going to have to balance, you know, exploration for my objective, um, exploration for safety, and um, exploration uh, kind of kind of optimization. So it's a kind of a three-way extended exploration, exploration, exploitation trade-off. And all I'm saying is that adding kind of this information criterion, kind of, let's say additively, for example, I don't know, it's just, I, I could see that that might work and you can actually prove that it works in some cases. Um, it's just, I, I find it disappointing. <laughs> and I can't really clarify it much more than, more than this, right? It just seems unnecessary to learn about the system everywhere, which is what this kind of information criterion ultimately encodes. And I would hope that we can do better. Okay. Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you again, Felix, especially given the time difference for being willing to do this. I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, no I will let me pause the recording.